taking a look at machine design in SOLIDWORKS. Um, what I'd like to do first is just get an idea of um, what make, making sure just the audio is working. So if people could just um, write into the chat or into the question area of the webinar there just to let me know that they are able to see my screen. So you should be able to see a, um, a machine uh, drawing on, my, on your screen now and that you should also be able to see or also, also should be able to hear me. Fantastic, that's looking pretty good. All right, welcome everybody. My name is Adrian Connard and I'm a Senior Applications Engineer here at Intercad. Um, what we're going to be taking a look at today in the next maybe 25 minutes or so is going to be um, some machine design work done with SOLIDWORKS. This is not a, um, a hard introduction, I guess, to SOLIDWORKS in terms of creating parts and assemblies and drawings. Um, however, if, even if you don't have that, um, that knowledge yet or you haven't seen any demonstrations on that yet, you'll still be able to glean quite a lot out of this, um, this demonstration. So what we're looking at here is a drawing of a capping machine. And there's a couple of things that we would like to, to do with this machine today. The first is going to be to add a motor um, and some support brackets to the gearbox that we see down the bottom here. And we also are going to be looking at designing um, the drive components as well. So we're going to add in um, edit a shaft, um, some pulleys and adding a belt into the system as well. So I'm going to move now from our drawing into our 3D model. So in SOLIDWORKS this is our assembly. So it contains all of the 3D components that make up our design. Now obviously as your designs become more and more complex it can be difficult to get to the area that you're trying to access. One of the ways that we make this easier in SOLIDWORKS is through what we call display states. So with display states, we're able to hide and show particular components very quickly and then turn them into a group or a display state. So for example, I can click on this motor display state here or I can click to my belt drive design display state and you can see it's not just turning components off and on but for example it's made these components here transparent. So you're able to set up these display states to make it easier to work with your more complex designs. Alright, so the big theme that we're going to be looking at today is reuse of data. So whenever we're doing machine design, um, quite often it's uh, all about reusing existing components, just using them in um, a more, or using them in different ways. So the first thing that I'm going to do that I need to do here is to bring in a motor onto this gearbox here. SOLIDWORKS has a design library area that allows you to store reused components, so components that you've designed that you'd like to use in other assemblies. In addition to that, we have uh, what we call the toolbox area. The toolbox area is comes standard with SOLIDWORKS and has a whole range of different standards of components. So we can see we've got ANSI there so, as well as Australian standard, ISO, etc. And then inside here we've got a whole bunch of different components. So we've got different, um, different bearings, bolts and screws, keys, nuts. Um, structural members, washers and things like that that come preloaded with SOLIDWORKS to make your machine design um, a lot faster. What I've actually got here though are some custom components that, I, that I've either designed or perhaps I've downloaded from a supplier website that I'd like to reuse here. So the first one that I'm going to bring in is onto this gearbox here, I'm going to bring this motor component. I'm going to drag this motor into the assembly here. When I bring it onto this flange here, however, it's automatically aligned the faces of the um, or automatically aligned the faces and also the holes of the motor with that flange there. Now the next step normally if I was doing this design work here would be to find out what fasteners I need to um, attach the motor to the flange. But obviously I'm going to be using those same fasteners every time. And so what we're going to be looking at 
what we're going to be doing quite a bit rather in this assembly is using functionality called smart features. Smart features allow you to bring along other components as well as other features, so things like holes and uh, recesses and things like that, and bring them into your design. So by, by right-clicking on the motor and selecting Insert Smart Features, it automatically understands which fasteners it needs to add into the design. And you can see them um, sort of in a ghost image there. As soon as I hit OK, they're going to be added to the design. So I haven't had to remember which particular fasteners I need for this particular motor. It's automatically brought that information with it when I inserted the motor into my design here. Okay, so we've added our motor, we've bolted it in, but the gearbox is sort of hanging in space here. So what I'm going to do is edit my frame that I've got here to add in some support for this motor here, or sorry, for the gearbox here. So I'm going to come in here, we're going to edit this, and I'm going to create a new sketch, which is a 2D sketch, on top of this frame here. I'm going to reorient myself now so that I can look down from the top of the design, just to make this next bit a little bit easier. I'm going to draw a couple of lines out here that, are going to, that I'm going to use to reference to design the rest of my frame. All right. Now, I'm not terribly concerned about the length, and you'll see why in a minute. I'm just going to close this sketch now. And what I want to do is use functionality that's inside the standard version of SolidWorks called weldments. Weldments are really good for what you see up here where you've got structural members like um, angle iron, I-beams, RHS, square sections, and things like that. So I'm going to use my weldment functionality here to add some rectangular hollow sections, some RHS, that's going to run along those two lines there. So I'll pick structural member, I'll pick my standards, the type, and the size, and these can be um, added to, um, out of the box from SolidWorks by downloading extra profiles from the SolidWorks website. So all I need to do now is select the sketch lines to show where I want to sit my RHS. Now, the problem I've got is that those lines that I drew actually define the top of the RHS, not the center as it is running through here. There's some really cool functionality with this structural member feature here, though, that allows me to locate the profile. So if I select Locate Profile, it zooms in on a 2D sketch of that profile, and I can choose where to run this line through. So I want it to define the top center of my RHS and it moves so that it's now defining the top middle of that, um, of the RHS. I hit OK, and well, it's looking OK. Um, obviously, the sizing isn't quite right, so I'm just going to hide the sketch because I don't need the sketch anymore. What I'm going to use is a tool called Trim Extend. Trim Extend is going to do exactly what it sounds like. It's going to trim this one back and extend them all out to match other parts of the frame. So I'm going to select the, the two bodies that I want to trim. My boundary will be this body here and this one here. And we can choose to keep these two, but this little extra piece that's hanging off the bottom here, I can very easily just um, toggle that flag there to discard that piece there. And as soon as I hit the tick, we can see it's now extended those out. Now, just quickly before we, I move away from here, I just want to show you, if I hide this one here, we can see it's coped that RHS around the angle iron, except in the area of the, the fillet in the angle iron, where it's actually put a, a chamfer in there to make it easier to weld together. All right, let's head back to the assembly now. And what I need to do now is add a mounting plate. But just like we did with the fasteners um, previously with the motor, the gearbox often has to have a mounting plate to sit it onto um, another component. So it also has smart features. So I'm going to insert those smart features. And we can see here it's adding in a plate 
as well as the tapped holes in here. In addition to the tapped holes in the plate, it's also adding in the screws necessary to fasten the motor to the plate. The only thing we need to tell it is this face here, which you can see highlighted in the graphics area there. So it's this face here. I'll click on here, hit the tick. And it, it's added the correct thickness plate to be able to fit between the face that I selected and the bottom of the motor. It's added the holes into here. And if I isolate this frame here, we can see it's also tapped the holes for me into that plate as well. So it's all about this reuse of design when we're designing machinery inside SolidWorks. All right. So this part is looking pretty good now. What we're going to do next is take a look at designing the other half, the upper half here of our design. So I'm going to switch to a different display state. So what we need to work on here is this jack shaft that we've got here, as well as this bracket. And then finally, we're going to run a belt. So we've already got one belt running through here. And you can see if I rotate this component around here, it also rotates the shaft. And it rotates it in the correct ratio as well. So what we're going to be doing is modifying this area here to take another pulley and then run a belt from here around the tensioner and then to this um, box here. So first step is this is even with a lot of the components missing, it's still a very cluttered area to be designing in. So what I'm going to do is select just the components that I want to work with and isolate those components. Now I can see it has brought along one extra component that I've accidentally selected, but if I select that component and press the tab key, I can very quickly hide that component. So now we can focus on the area that we're actually interested in. All right, so let's actually have a look at what we've got here at the moment. I'm going to take a section through here so we can have a better look at what we've got here. So I click on my section tool and I've got a section plane that I can pass through my design. So about there, we'll have a look at what we've got. So up the top here, I've got a bearing, I've got my um, retaining ring, snap ring, I've got a groove that the snap ring sits into. This is the nominal bore of my bracket, but we can see that it's been bored out further to be able to take the bearing in the first place. We've also machined down the shaft to take the bearing, and we've also got an undercut here at the base of that machining there as well. So there's quite a lot that needs to go on with this shaft here at the bottom before we can bring in our um, bearing. So the first thing that I need to do to deal with though is the fact that the shaft doesn't quite reach to where I need it to reach in here. If we have a look here, if I select the end of the shaft here and here, so if I select, select these two faces, I can see that the distance between the two is five millimeters. Another thing while I'm here that I can take a look at is if I have a look at this bearing here, we can see that it is the 17 millimeter bore bearing. So we know the size of the bearing that we've got here. So knowing that, I'm going to need to make some changes. This shaft here is the correct length. I don't want to change the length of the shaft, at least not at this stage. What I do want to change is the design for this bracket here. So I'm going to go in and edit the sketch that was used to design this bracket. Now I can see at the moment that there is no dimension between the bottom of the shaft and the bottom of the bracket here. So I'm going to add that dimension in. So from the bottom of the shaft to the bottom of the bracket, I try to place this dimension down and I get it, oh, this warning here. What it's warning me is that there are now too many dimensions in here to fully locate everything and that things may, be, may end up in conflict with one another. 
I've got two choices. I can either leave this dimension as a what we call driven dimension, so I can't change it. All it will do is report what that dimension is. Now, that's not what I want because I want this to be five millimeters. So I'm going to leave it as a driving dimension. And we end up in what's called an overdefined state. So in this sketch, there are too many dimensions dimensioning everything and they may conflict with one another. To get past this, I click on the overdefined button to start a tool called Sketch Expert. I diagnose my problem and it gives me two solutions. The first solution is delete that 25 dimension. Well, that's pretty obvious. I mean, if I delete that dimension, I'm going to go back to where I was before. But it's saying one of two solutions. So if I click on the next solution, it says you can delete this 200 dimension here and keep that 25 mil dimension and you will no longer be what we call overdefined. So it has done the work for me to try to investigate why there were too many dimensions and what dimensions were conflicting with what dimensions. So it's now told me which dimension it needs to get rid of in order to keep this dimension. So I'm going to accept it. Green means go, hit the tick. And we've now got rid of that 200 dimension that was conflicting and we've now got our 25 mil dimension. So in order to match the other end of the bracket here, I'm going to change this dimension from 25 to 5 and it's changed the length of the bracket to suit. Come back out and so now we've got the same offset at either end of our shaft. All right, so the bracket's looking a bit better now. What I'd like to do next is add, add some wrench flats to this shaft so that while somebody's uh, maintaining the, um, the system, they're able to manually rotate this shaft around. So in my design library here, I have in my features folder some wrench flats. So this is a, a perfect example of a feature that you may need to add quite a lot. Uh, you don't want to have to add the feature add the feature manually every time. So we've stored it in the design library. So all I need to do now is drag it, drop it onto the shaft. Oops, sorry, I need to edit my shaft. Drag my flats onto the shaft. And it's it wanting to know basically where to locate the dimension from. So I'm going to pick my locating edge of up the top here. And it puts my flats onto the shaft. I can play around with this dimension here, so maybe I only want it to be 65 from the end. <coughs> Excuse me. And it shifts that flat up the top there. So this is a good example of a reusable feature that we may want to add to multiple shafts. There's no point creating the feature manually every time. Switch back. Now as I rotate the shaft around you can see the flats moving with the shaft and the rest of the components. All right, next step is obviously the bottom of this shaft here is not being supported at the moment, so I want to bring in another bearing. So again, in my design library here, I have a bearing. I'm going to drag this in. I just want to rotate this around a little bit. Drag this in to my design. The bearing will auto size two different components. So depending on the size of the cylinder, so the, the, the cylindrical shape that you're dragging it onto, it will change the size of the, the bearing that we're bringing in here. So I'm going to drag and drop this onto this shaft here, drop it down, and there's my bearing. I'm going to bring that down here and locate it. Now before I do that though, I just want to check because if I have a look here, I can see that it's actually brought in the 20 mil bore because there's actually, if you remember rightly, a step down on this shaft. So we don't actually want to size the bearing to this dimension here. We want it to be slightly smaller. No problem though, I can just bring up the properties and change it from the 20 mil bore down to the 17 mil bore. Hit OK and it changes the size of the bearing for me on the fly. I now want to locate the bearing, so I want it to be flush with the end of the shaft. 
So that's given me the location of the bearing. Now, next I want to bring in all of my smart features that I've got with the bearing. The bearing is a great example with smart features because there are often quite a lot of machining operations that need to occur with your when you have a, um, a bearing. So I'm going to insert my smart features and sure enough you can see there are a large number of features that are being added in. The first thing it needs to know is what is this the equivalent of this component here. I'll select this, this component. The second component you can see highlighted in blue is the shaft, so I'll select the shaft. We've now got two green ticks. I can now hit the tick and it's going to add all of the machining operations into my components. So if I hide my bearing and we'll just run another section through here, you can see all of the features have now been added to these components. So we've added in the bore for the bearing as, along with a fillet at the bottom for strength. We've also turned down the shaft and also added um, the undercut fillet into the shaft as well, all in one go. All right, we'll bring back the bearing. and get rid of my section. So, but the problem we've got at the moment is this bearing is just going to drop straight out. So in order to locate it, I'm going to go back to my design library and we'll grab our retaining ring, drop it in. It's sized itself to the, to the, the, the correct size for this um, ball that we've got here. It, however, at the moment, can still rotate. It can still um, move up and down. So I'm just going to grab the, the little point there and the bottom face of the bearing and align those two together. That's looking pretty good. Last step is going to be to bring in my smart features, which for our retaining ring is the groove. All right, so now our bearing's not going anywhere. So very quickly we've been able to add quite a lot of features to the bracket, as well as adding in the bearing and the retaining ring. All right, so next step is going to be to add a pulley to our shaft here. So we've got some different sized sprockets. I'm going to grab my 36 teeth, bring it on, drag and drop it onto here. And we've added in our pulley. Now the pulley is not going to stay centered like that all by itself. So I'm going to use the smart features of the, of the pulley to bring in the correct sized bushing. It's also bringing in, not just bringing in the bushing, but also bringing in the, um, the bolts necessary to fasten it as well. All right. Now as I rotate this around, you can see at the moment we've still got a problem. While these rotate around correctly, they're not joined together. But luckily, I've got some, some features in my bushing that allow me to bring in the keyway and also a key. So all I need is the shaft, which you can see highlighted in blue. So I'll select my shaft, hit the tick, and it's brought in my key and the keyway. And if I rotate it around to reorient it and rebuild it. We can see it moves the keyway as well. If I move this up and down, it will also move that. So I need to now decide the orientation I want. So what I might do is I'm going to bring this around such that the keyway, so the key and this flat face here are going to be perpendicular to one another. So I'm going to add a perpendicular relation between the two. So that's going to set my orientation. So now I can't rotate 
the, um, the pulley independent of the shaft anymore. They all move together. All right, we're almost there. So the last step, I'm going to exit out of my isolate now to bring the rest of the components back. And we're going to bring, run a belt between these pulleys here. Now before I can do that, I need to locate this vertically so that it lines up with the rest of the components here. So I'm going to use the planes passing through the middle of the pulleys here and I'm going to use one more relation to relate the two to make them lined up. So now they're all planar to one another and it's time to run a belt pulley through, or a, a belt rather, through these pulleys. Now it's not a command that I run a lot, so I don't have, I'm not quite sure where to find this command in SOLIDWORKS. There's a really cool feature in SOLIDWORKS that allows us to search for commands. So if I start to type belt into here, it shows me the belt, the belt chain command and I can click on it to run it or I can click on the glasses to have it show me where to find this particular command. So it's clicking on here to show me this is where I can find this particular command. So I'll click on belt chain and we can pick on faces, we can pick on pitch circles like we've got here to define the path of the belt. It is automatically going to calculate the ratio of rotation between the components based on the size of the feature that you select. So if this is not correct, we can actually select on each one here and set what exactly what um, the ratios are between those components to get the, ro the ratio of um, uh, rotation between the components correct. In my case, these are correct. I'm also going to create a separate belt part that you'll see in a minute. If we want, we can also set a driving length for the, the belt as well. So I hit OK and it creates a belt component um, in my assembly. If I move components inside the assembly, the belt will update to the new position. So it's always going to stay attached to those components there. I'm going to come down into my the belt now and you can see we've actually got a part here. And I'm going to use the sketch to create my belt itself. So I'm just going to do an extrusion. create my belt. I can also say apply a material, we'll make it out of rubber, that way all of our mass calculations are correct, it's not trying to calculate it as if it was made out of steel or something like that. And there's our complete component. I'll hide my sketch and if I rotate one of these components now, if I can get a hold of the, the belt, you can see the other components move in the correct ratio. Indeed, as this one rotates around, it'll drive the other belt as well to drive the other pulley. So we're almost complete. We'll bring back all of the components. The last thing that we're going to do is take a look at how this affects our drawing. So I'm going to switch back to the drawing of the assembly and if I zoom out, come back in here, see currently we've got 75 components. If I rebuild the bill of materials, it's going to add in all of those components that, we, that we've added in, so our gearbox, the timing, sprocket, etc., all of those components have been added but it's a little difficult to actually show the components in the current view. So what I'm going to do is take a section through this view here in order to better show those components. So I'm going to grab my section view tool and we're going to draw a line passing through
Stop snapping right there. We go. Do a partial section, and I'll place this partial section up here. So we can now see our shaft. We can see the bracket. We can see the belts, but it's still a bit messy. The the section by default section is all the way through. So I don't actually want to sh to show all of the components all the way through. So I'm going to set a section depth by grabbing a hold of this and just showing how far I actually want a section. So I could say I only want a section to this depth here. And when we rebuild, I come up here, it's now only showing the components to that depth. Now it's still showing some extra components out here that I don't want. So what I'm going to do is create a detail view. So I'm going to show the area or sketch out the area that I, I want to show there and then come back to my view and create a cropped view. Sorry, not, not a detail view. We're going to crop that view out. That's looking much better. Maybe we can play around with the scale a little bit. So the scale doesn't need to be the same for all views. I'm going to use a custom scale, say 1 to 4. That's looking much better. We've got much better visibility on those components. And finally, in order to match up with the part numbers that we've got in our bill of materials here, I'm going to go to my annotation tab and auto balloon. These balloons are attached to what we call magnet lines. As I move these magnet lines around, it moves all of the components with it. So if I want to run them on an angle, I can do that and it keeps the spacing the same throughout. And there's our updated drawing. So thank you very much for your attention everybody. Um, what, I, what I'll do now is open it up to questions. So I'm just going to close all of the questions that were um, just you letting me know that you could hear me. And yeah, so if you have any questions, feel free to use the, um, the question um, area and um, I'll be happy to answer those questions. Okay, so the first question I've got there is that in the, um, in the assembly mode, I was able to very quickly open up the display states dialog box. To do that, if you right click on the double, on the display pane arrows, so if I right click here, it will show the display state um, options there. So you don't need to go to the configuration manager to do that. Okay, uh, there's a question about being able to get a copy of the video. This video will be made available to uh, available on the Intercad website along with our other webinars that we have run previously. So there's the previous webinar that I run was a bit more of an introduction to um, to SolidWorks. So rather than focusing on an area like machine design, it was a, a much more um, basic introduction to SolidWorks. So yes, they're available on the, um, the Intercad website. Yep, there was a question about the belt. You can set a length, so a driving length of the belt, and as long as at least one of the pulleys in your design has a degree of freedom, it will drive that belt length to uh, what you have set and drag the other components to the correct position. Okay, the, there's a question about being a, where you can download more weldment profiles. It's not actually on the SolidWorks website. If you, oh, I've got to remember where I get this. If you go to your design library 
and then up to SOLIDWORKS content. If you expand out SOLIDWORKS content and go to weldments, there's a whole bunch of, these are basically zip files with a huge number, hundreds of profiles um, of different types, you know, RHS, uh, SHS, etc. And as it says there, you just control click on them to download those profiles. Yep, so the, the, the basic video is up and, um, I believe, is up and ready to view, and if it's not, then it will be up, for, um, up very shortly. Okay, so you, you've asked about, uh, there's a question about um, other branded bearings being added to the design library. Many um, bearing manufacturers now will actually allow you to um, download 3D models of their um, of their bearings um, from their website. Obviously, it's in their interest because it means you're more likely to specify their 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 components when you do so. However, even if you don't, you have the ability. All, all of those features that I, I was adding today, you have the ability to create yourself in your own parts. So you would basically create those features once, and um, you would then be able to um, reuse that component um, and those features as you've seen me there today. Okay, there's a question about uh, part tolerance. So when you're designing your components, um, you can put a tolerance into the dimension yourself so that when you then bring that component into um, a drawing, it will have the tolerance to dimensions. If you're referring to more to interference, as in are there any interferences in my assembly right now, um, you have the ability on the Evaluate tab to perform interference detection as well as clearance verification. So you can check to make sure no components are interfering. You can also check to see, for example, if you want to find out how close two components get, you want to make sure that there's always at least half a mil of clearance. You can select those two components and it will tell you what the current clearance is. So uh, there's a question about smart features, being able to put um, new smart, or being able to put smart features into a new component. So while you're working on a component, let's say you wanted these features here to be part of the, the, the smart feature, um, you have the ability, to go, oh, that's right, it has to be at the assembly level. So you have the ability to insert um, smart features here, so, oh, sorry, smart features. Um, into your assembly, providing it doesn't already have smart features in it, which is why this one's greyed out. And then it will take you through a wizard to determine which parts need to be brought along with the, with the, um, the smart feature and which, which components need to be left behind. Um, and you can choose which dimensions also are able to be changed by the, um, by the end user. I believe, don't quote me on it, but I believe in the tutorials there may be a tutorial on um, smart smart components, but I'm just not sure. There is there. So in your tutorials, there is a tutorial on smart components. So it'll show you how to create them and modify them. All right, guys. I think that's about. It. I think that's about it. Thank you very much for your um, for your time. Um, I hope you've got a lot out of it, and I hope to see you back here for training.